Okay, so in part three of this week's lecture content, I'm going to go through some um, more sociological theories of consumption. I'm going to move away from the kind of overt ideological critique of the Frankfurt School and talk about some ways of thinking about consumption that I suppose allows us to understand some difference um, within consumer practices um, and how these really relate to ideologies, but also uh, other kind of critical ways to think about how ideology is inherent in consumer um, culture. So again, there's some links to videos there, you can check those out. Um, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is semiotics. Um, so semiotics is essentially what's called the science or the study of signs, and I'm going to concentrate here on looking at how this can be used to think about consumption. So um, if we think about consumer culture as being made up of, of things like, you know, uh, shoes, washing powders, um, you know, McDonald's, all these kind of different things that we engage in day-to-day -day life. The value of those things is different compared, um, largely dependent on the way that societies kind of um, decide uh, through various hierarchies of knowledge about what is worthy, worthy and what's not, what's cool and what's not, all these kind of different ways of valuing things. Relating back to Marx, in a way, um, you know, things have use value. So a shoe, for instance, is meant to be just kind of basically a practical device that you put on your foot that allows you to kind of get around in more comfort so you don't, you know, cut your feet or have blisters. Um, or you may argue in terms of its use value, it allows you to work more efficiently if you're doing some kind of manual labour. But of course, something like a shoe in our consumer society has very different values dependent upon what kind of shoe it is. Something like brands, for instance, allows, you know, more value to be placed on a shoe to other, others, whether that's like between the kind of sports brands of, say, Nike and Adidas to give, you know, um, connotations of coolness and athleticism compared to, say, a home brand brand or something that's sold in Lowe's or, in, or in, on Vinnie's. Same shoe, or at least very closely the same shoe, made out of the same materials, will have different values. So therefore, we can think about semiotics as a way of reading the cultural values. We're moving away from the use value here to the symbolic value. Consumer culture in particular has a whole bunch of kind of hierarchies around the symbolic value of different products and things and, and songs and films and texts. So semiotics asks us, allows us to um, qu question what an object means. <coughs> Pardon me. Why do people desire them? And what larger cultural myths do these objects embody? Now, semiotics is particularly useful for thinking about advertising um, and the different um, the, the way that we can kind of analyse the different symbols and the different kind of connotations that things are given in advertising. This is particularly useful when we're thinking about gender. You now you think about the different ways that advertising is directed um, at different genders around, you know, um, care work or you know, masculinity and all these kind of different things that are used. Um, but also, advertising kind of uses semiotics in that sense as well. It tries to manipulate symbols and brands to kind of make us feel and think and do particular things. So, semiotics is a study of signs. Um, but, like, signs here aren't just kind of, you know, stop signs or signs on the road or the kind of things give us instructions. Signs is broadening out here. Um, signs are all the images, sounds, odours, flavours, acts, texts, objects, these things that have no intrinsic meaning except for that which we imagine them to have. So, getting back to the shoe there, this is kind of moved from the use value of the thing to the symbolic value. So, signs in this sense have meaning because we invest in, uh, we give them meaning. Um, and often the sign in that sense stands in for kind of different cultural values and ethics and, and things like that. And so if we can kind of do a semiotic analysis in a sense of science, like think of the, the um, traffic light, you know, it's a thing that allows us to stop and go, but like, why is red for stop and green for go? What, how does, where does this come from? What is the histories and um, associations that kind of leads us to kind of totally now associate red with stop in that situation? Signs are also can be really confusing, you know, caution tomatoes there, like, you know, what is there a killer tomato coming up the road? You have to interpret what's going on there. It doesn't just give you some direct meaning. The freeway ones there I put up because you see those signs at the end of the F3 freeway on the way to Sydney. And when I was a kid going to Sydney, I always thought that the kind of 
sign there with the kind of red line going through it was no camping because I thought that was a, was a tent, not a freeway. So here you can see like this interpretation of signs, even when the signs are meant to be giving us specific information. Certainly when we start moving beyond, you know, things like graffiti and things like culture damming I'll talk about later on, um, these allow some kind of resistive um, uses, uses of sign to kind of go against ideologies as well. So semiotics is the science of signs. We can kind of break down a sign into kind of three levels. The sign itself, so the shoe, the signifier, what makes up the, the shoe, you know, the, the sign in that sense, you know, the leather, the laces, the colours, and the signified, the meanings attached to that. And this is in particular where marketing comes in with consumer products. They try to attach a whole bunch of meanings to particular products. So, you know, you get the particular athlete to, to wear it and to say good things about it, to be pictured in it to, and that kind of thing, to try and associate that shoe with all these other meanings of, say, athleticism or coolness or fashion or whatever, to be able to try and sell that to more people. So that's one way of thinking about how advertising uses semiotics. We want to break it down further. We can see like how signs are kind of almost taken for granted and like the different kind of shapes that we associate things. So here you can kind of, you know, very much see the Lego shapes there it would probably remind you of the Simpsons, even though they're just kind of colored blocks. We can kind of read into things quite deeply when we come to just associate and get to know them and kind of treat them as normal. In the second example there, there's like, you know, Rocky and Mr. T out of the Rocky movies. The top one is a pretty kind of, everyday example of, you know, hegemonic masculinity, you know, the two boxes facing off, about to have the fight. But if you put a hand on the face in the second one, it completely changes the meaning of that situation to a more kind of tender, even sexualized moment. So here a hand changes everything. The sign there um, signifies something else. So semiotics has um, been a, a really influential uh, way of analyzing cultures. Um, and particularly in consumer culture. I'm not going to go into the detail too much there, what that um, goes into. It allows you to kind of think about the different aspects of semiotics a little bit more, so have a read of that. Certainly Ferdinand de Saussure and Charles Pierce are key names here, but if you want to kind of find what I think is the classic test, text of semiotics is Roland Barthes, which is B-A-R-T-H-E-S, classic book, the Mythologies, where he almost writes these little short stories around different consumer products and unpacks them through semiotics in terms of the myths and connotations and meanings they have in cultures. So let's do a quick semiotic reading of, say, Lorna Jane's exercise singlet. The sign, there's the, the singlet itself. The signifier, Lorna Jane brand, it has a motivational message. And what's the signified, what's the signified concept? A healthy lifestyle of being active and strong. And particularly, um, this is marketed towards women and the image is used um, in that marketing tends to be women. So you can see Lana Jane here is trying to sell, you know, what's essentially something to wear by creating an uh, attachment or an association with a particular lifestyle, with a particular way of life, particular ethics and morals, particularly uh, around healthy and health and exercise. But what would an oppositional reading look like of that? So one of the things that semiotics and what I'm about to talk about in a minute in terms of encoding and decoding allows us not just to necessarily take on the ideological messages that are embedded in these signs, but it allows us to have some kinds of oppor oppositional or negotiated readings of these things as well. So Stuart Hall and colleagues in the, sub, in the, um, Frank, in the, sorry, in the Birmingham School, which um, I'll talk about more in a minute as well, started to think about semiotics and developing it away through what they called encoding and decoding. The argument here is that, you know, consumer and popular culture texts, texts and goods and things can be encoded deliberately by the company that's making them with particular meanings. But then it's up to the us as consumers to decode them. And depending on who we are and, you know, what attitude we have, and maybe you can relate this to Borges' habitus, um, we tend to then maybe um, negotiate and read these texts in different ways. So they point out that some texts are more closed than others. Some have a kind of strong uh, encouragement of a particular interpretation, others are more open. But I think the more interesting here is the different ways that texts are read. For Hall and colleagues, there's a dominant or hegemonic reading where the consumer will just read the sign through that kind of ideological stuff that's embedded in it. There's a negotiated reading where the reader can partly accept the sign or the text code, but kind of reject others. There's an oppositional or counter-hegemonic reading 
where the reader does not share the text code and kind of rejects it. And there's an aberrant reading, which is largely kind of reading um, the signs through a different code completely. So let me unpack that with a, an example. So again, think about the Nike swoosh or even say in a Nike shoe. The sign here is the symbol itself. That's, you know, the shoe um, signifies a Nike shoe, the apparel brand. But what's the signified concept here? You know, Nike wants us to associate it with athleticism, being healthy, being cool. Um, so the dominant reading of that would be someone would see that shoe and go, oh, yeah, Michael Jordan's cool, or, yeah, I want to be like a Serena Williams, you know, let's go to the shop and get some because I want to associate myself with those things. A negotiated reading might reject the Nike, you know, and they might think of that ASICs are better or um, find the athlete that, you know, is being advertised in using that shoe a bit annoying and, you know, that they need to get boots anyway to play the game and they might go and get them anyway. But an oppositional reading might actually reject the whole um, makeup of the signs of that thing. So, you know, for instance, with Nikes, you know, there's very much well known now that they've been made in sweatshops in horrible labour practices. So rather than the shoe, therefore, signifying coolness or athleticism, more likely maybe for some people, you know, represent sweatshops and, you know, poor labour practices and, and dirty politics and exploitation and alienation. Um, so here you can see there's room in consumer culture for people to reject the ideology of the of the system itself. The aberrant coding is kind of more just like, you know, why is there a tick on the side of your shoe? Or, you know, why do you even have those things on your feet? This could be kind of, I suppose, a more cross-cultural uh, culture shock kind of reading of things where we don't really understand what's going on with the sign. So semiotic theories have been really useful for um, critically analysing consumer culture. And semiotics has been particularly um, used in what's called subcultural theories developed by the Birmingham School from the late 60s and um, early 70s um, in Birmingham in England. But this, um, these ideas have spread out throughout the kind of sociological world. So where the kind of Frankfurt School saw pop culture and consumer culture as kind of a, nothing but a side of ideology, the Birmingham School kind of bring on a more semiotic analysis and start thinking about the idea of hegemony. So hegemony here is the idea that powerful groups can't just kind of repress the powerless. They have to kind of have consensus and compromise every now and then, otherwise there will be a revolution. And so this, they argue that kind of pop culture and consumer culture becomes this kind of site of struggle between the dominant and the dominated. So um, this is an idea, again, that consumer culture has you know, more room going on for interpretation and activity and even creativity and art than the Frankfurt School kind of led on. So the Birmingham School, as I said, uh, 60s in the UK, what they started to do was say, well, okay, the Frankfurt School is kind of right about this kind of mainstream, kind of mindless consumption in many ways, but if you look around, there's all kinds of really interesting forms of pop culture and consumer culture going on. People like punks and goths and these kind of things were doing forms of consumer culture that didn't look a lot like mainstream ideology. So they started to associate these different kinds of consumption with different groups, uh, particularly the working class. Um, so here the Birmingham School starts to look at different kinds of consumer culture as actual forms of resistance to dominant ideology. So the punks here aren't, you know, kind of you know, doing day-to-day -day life as a normal thing. The mohawk here isn't just a haircut, it's a symbol of being an outsider. It's a kind of almost an aggressive resistance to being kind of normal in, a, in the mainstream world. For the Birmingham School, subcultures allow people to kind of have some semblance of autonomy, some agency in a world where they feel largely powerless and allows them to have some kinds of self-expression. Um, in youth studies in particular, subcultures uh, are kind of scenes and spaces where young people that don't really kind of fit in often find people like them and, you know, develop relationships and, and identities around that kind of thing. Subcultural theories point out that a lot of the activities here are around rituals. So, you know, there's about gigs and, you know, people playing loud music and, you know, jumping up and down and spitting on each other in punk gigs and stuff like that, which I'll talk about more next week when we look at um, uh, youth studies. Uh, so here you can see there's kind of room for autonomy within cultural, um, the consumer culture. So what basically the Birmingham School have done is like move from like, if it's popular, it must be bad of the Frankfurt School to it's popular, it must be bad, but unless it's done by these kind of, you know, people that are doing consumer culture and pop culture in this way.
is more resistive everyday way. So pop culture here becomes a site of struggle and you know you can use kind of semiotic analysis to kind of see the different ways that subcultures manipulate symbols you know so punks wear garbage bags as clothing to symbolize they were treated by garbage and use um, safety pins for earrings and, and you know the mohawk and that kind of stuff but also involves what they call bricolage. Bricolage involves tinkering with cultural products um, borrowing, combining, recombining, discarding, altering, embellishing, inventing, synthesizing to create something new. So there's lots of different kind of examples like this. Graffiti is a really good example. Essentially graffiti is an act of bricolage because it changes a wall into a canvas. It changes something that's everyday, like, you know, you just kind of take it for granted and reinvents it to use it for something else. Something about self-expression, art, or even resistance. Um, the use of kind of a, a car park to skateboard in is an act of bricolage. It uses something that's basically there for people to park in while they produce or consume. Skateboarders go into those spaces, reinvent that public space to use it for forms of leisure and self-expression. You can see people that kind of make gender critiques using Barbie dolls to make kind of silly porn cartoons on YouTube. Again, it's an act of bricolage there as well. So here in, within the consumer culture, reusing the kind of signs and texts and things of it in different ways to express resistance um, is done through these kind of subcultural activities and through acts of bricolage. So in, you can see how this relates to kind of Bourdieu's idea of habitus. And I spoke um, in the previous week on class talking about how Bourdieu talks about where we're um, socialised into the world to have a particular way of being and seeing and feeling that feel for the game. And obviously, therefore, the way that we engage in, with different consumer products or the very way we consume is very much relate, relating to that kind of idea of habitus. And I spoke also about how taste classifiers and it classifies the classifier. And you can see how semiotics is really useful for kind of, I suppose, doing that analysis of how taste classifies, who's doing the classifying, what it means, and how this relates to hierarchies and histories and myths. So taste particularly in terms of this kind of thing, relates to cultural capitals. And often that can be done, um, we can do analysis between high culture and low culture, but more so today within culture, uh, within popular culture. There's lots of different distinctions in terms of what people like and how they relate to things based on their class, race, ethnicity and gender. So the final um, uh, sociologist I want to talk about here is Zygmunt Bauman. Um, who wrote extensively about consumer culture throughout the, the 90s and early 2000s. Bauman's a bit of a magpie in terms of kind of picks and chooses and brings together all the perspectives that I've been talking about so far. Influenced by the likes of the Frankfurt School and Bourdieu and kind of anthropological understandings like Miller and certainly in um, um, aspects of semiotics and brings this, this stuff into thinking about what life today is like as a consumer. And Bauman basically makes the argument that consumption has begun to consume life itself. He argues that even as individuals, we're increasingly creating ourselves as consumer goods, something to be kind of judged, something to be promoted. You can see that people now talk about having a personal brand. So for Bauman, consumer culture has become so, in, you know, so overwhelming that consumers themselves are turning themselves into commodities. And you can particularly see this, this in kind of the ways that people have over the years from you know, MySpace through to Twitter and Snapchat and, and TikTok today, and particularly on reality shows, kind of have this kind of, I suppose, self-branding exercise going on, on in these spaces. So where we must, may have promoted ourselves for a job in a particular in interview, Bauman argues this kind of self-promotion as almost a consumer product, a brand has become a way of life. Echoing the Frankfurt School, he talks about how... Um, the consumer culture can never produce satisfaction. Consumer culture is about producing desire and new desires again and again and again. Um, what would happen if we became satisfied in consumer culture? We'd stop consuming and the whole system would break down. So for this, um, it talks about how this process is enabled because these products are laden with cultural myths, again relating back to the semiotics here, and they are arouse desire in us to consume, to have, to want, um, and really therefore moves to the point where we think we need these things because we want to signify to others that we kind of mean something through these texts and products. So new desires must be constantly created and you can see this through 
Um, the advertising industry is, but increasingly this is done through algorithms that I'll talk about in last week, of course. And there's a constant kind of cycle that um, I think the um, Story of Stuff video highlighted really well. So again, Bauman's re referring back here to um, Frankfurt School ideas of false consciousness and pseudo-individuality. There's an impossibility of living one's life as anything else than a consumer, but we kind of then express our freedom through these exercises of what we think of free will by choosing these products that are almost the same. And you can see the, the conga line of the iPhones there to kind of express the, the sameness of these products. <clears throat> okay, so I'll leave it there in terms of the ideas of um, different ways of thinking about consumption sociologically. And in part four, I'll talk about some political aspects of consumption.